I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Kate DeConnick the new executive director of the Cone Center for Genocide and Holocaust Studies. Kate has a doctorate in religion and society from Harvard University and has taught courses on the Holocaust and related topics. We're very excited to have her here today, along with our other special guests, most particularly Cantor and psychologist Rosalie Giroud, but I'm going to let Kate do the introductions. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Dina, and thanks to everyone for making time to be with us on a Sunday afternoon for this program. Um, Dina did a great job of introducing me, but I'm the director of the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College. And I was honored to be able to be asked by the committee to be here with you today to help moderate today's event and our conversation with our audience. Um, so I'm just gonna provide a quick little introduction and then we're gonna dive right into our conversation together. Um, before we begin, we wanted to tell you just a little bit about what International Holocaust Remembrance Day is. Um, it's commemorated traditionally on January 27th, which was a Friday this year. Um, and in 2005, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution to designate January 27th, at, which is the anniversary of the Auschwitz liberation, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So the purpose of this day, it has two core foci or focuses. First is to remember the victims of the Nazi regime. And second is to promote Holocaust education throughout the world. So you see this, this day being commemorated and marked in many different ways across the globe right around this time of year. And one thing that's interesting to me is that since 2010, the United Nations has also designated specific themes for the annual commemorations. And the theme for 2023, which is this year, is home and belonging. So the general framing is reflecting on what these concepts mean to persecuted individuals during the Holocaust or Shoah and in its aftermath. Um, I, I love these themes and I love that they have such a great connection with today's event, which is focused on the intergenerational consequences of the Holocaust. So just so we're all on the same page, um, today's program is divided into two main parts. The first part is going to be a discussion with our panelists who are descendants of Holocaust survivors. And um, then afterwards, we're going to have a community chat where everyone who's part of our audience will be invited to engage and converse with us. So the panelists during the first opening part are going to talk a little bit about their family backgrounds and how the trauma of the Holocaust or their family's experiences have affected them. And then lastly, what lessons they think can be learned from the fact that there are these effects on subsequent generations. So after that, we're gonna pivot. We're gonna move into a community-wide conversation and chat. We'll ask you all if there's anything that you would like to share. Uh, we'll also ask you if there's anything in particular that you've learned that you wanna share with the group. Um, if you'd prefer, as we're hearing different stories and we're hearing different panelists speak, if you'd like to put things in the chat along the way while they're kind of striking you in the moment, please feel free to do that. We can voice some of those during the conversation too. Um, but however you would love to engage, we, we would invite that. <laughs> All right, so in just a second, I'm going to turn things over and we're going to get into a conversation with our panelists. Um, but just so you know, we're joined today by Dina, who just introduced herself, by Michelle Adler, by Elliot Eisenberg, and by Rosalie Jarrett, who I'm going to turn things over to in just a second. Um, with respect to Rosalie, it's important to know that she's the daughter of Shoah survivors. She's also an educational psychologist and the co-founder of a nonprofit organization called OneByOne.org that helps Holocaust survivors and their descendants and others deal with their experiences. So we're extremely fortunate to have her as one of our participants today. Um, and she also has a book called Journeys of Transformation, which is in the process of publication. Um, so Rosalie, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Dina because uh, she's going to speak first. Thank you, Dina. You're, you, know, you need to unmute Dina. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I lived with my mother and my maternal grandmother. My maternal grandparents were from Poland, from a small town near Vilna. They came to the United States in about 1914 to escape anti-Semitism. Two of my grandmother's brothers came as well. Her other eight siblings remain in Europe. I was recently told by one of my cousins that 
those eight were unable to come to America because of immigration quotas. Some were killed in the Ponary Forest Massacre outside of Vilna. Two of my mother's cousins survived concentration camps and eventually came to America. My mother did not talk about her parents' experiences, why they left Poland, what happened to her mother's siblings or the experiences of her relatives in the Holocaust. We rarely saw the cousins, even though they lived nearby and we had very few other relatives. Growing up, I thought her reticence resulted from a desire to assimilate into American culture. But reflecting back and remembering that she seemed to have to gear herself up to visit with the cousin who talked frequently of the Shoah, I think she had a lot of anxiety about her family's background. As a consequence of all this silence, I grew up feeling as though our family had a big secret. Preparing for this program, I remembered how as a young child, I would spend hours searching through the basement and my mother's things for something that might explain our lives. I thought there was something about us, something about being Jewish that was shameful. I was very paranoid that anyone outside of yeshiva would discover that I was Jewish. And this feeling that I had to hide my identity as a Jewish person continued well into adulthood. At Stephen Soros' request, I asked my son who lives in Israel about his experience. He says that in many societies, language and information is passed down through decades of storytelling, that families are many societies, and that he too grew up feeling there was a big mystery in our family because we didn't have a community of relatives and stories to tell. That's that's my story, <laughs> uh, Rosalie. Um, and yeah. it seems that you're still impacted and deeply emotionally impacted by this. Yeah, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it and it was a little bit of a shocker when I when I spoke to my son this morning to find out that I somehow had passed on this feeling of mystery. Um, which was completely unintended. But um, I don't want to occupy too much time. But let's let's uh, move to Michelle. Yes, hey. hi. Uh, so uh, yeah, my name is, um, uh, so I'm Mike, but um, most people, uh, but I also respond to Michelle, which is my <laughs> friend's name. And uh, I, where I was born in uh, 1941, in uh, Lyon, France, which was at that time in the French, the free zone. And uh, I'm a child of Holocaust survivors and a survivor myself. Uh, my father, um, Camillo Adler, was born in Austria and grew up in Poland and Vienna and immigrated to France in 1930 because he was unable to find employment due to the rampant anti-Semitism. And um, I should mention that my mother was also from uh, Austria. Uh, so my father joined uh, the French Foreign Legion to fight Hitler and then returned to Lyon after France's surrender to Germany. After the second occupation of the Free Zone uh, in 1944, fall of 1942, my father and family were forced to flee their home um, in France when I was 16 months old. The journey to Switzerland was difficult and filled with, with, filled with anxiety and uncertainty. And initially the family was put in a refugee uh, reception camp in Switzerland, and then we were separated. Uh, I was placed into a Salvation Army nursery. I was all of 16 months old. Mm -hmm. And my brother was placed in a home and school for Jewish boys. My father was in several refugee camps as well as my mother. And then in the end, he was in a labor camp, which was, uh, probably a good thing because you could earn a little bit more money doing doing work. And in this case, uh, pretty much hard labor, however, uh, as uh, doing land rec reclamation. Uh, eventually the church found the family a home in the Swiss mountains. 
And after the war, my father found employment in Zurich in 1951. We resettled in New York after my father's death. I discovered my father's manuscripts, which I translated and published uh, his memoirs entitled, I'm a Refugee. And uh, just as a plug, it's available on Amazon. Um, so in, in terms of how this experience affected me, uh, let me um, uh, say, say the following is that um, uh, when you were in the refugee camps in Switzerland, and if you were separated, you could, you had visiting rights where they actually paid for train tickets and so forth uh, to see each other. And, uh, but these occurred only every six or eight weeks. And uh, for a child my age, uh, it wasn't really enough time. Or it was too much time uh, between visits. And uh, uh, I forgot who my parents were, uh, actually. That is, didn't recognize them uh, after a while. And uh, that's still a serious problem, I think, today with uh, asylum seekers where you had that fiasco of uh, family separation. Um, so uh, I must say though, as a whole, I enjoyed my childhood in Switzerland, uh, but I became cognizant of anti-Semitism uh, after the war when we moved to Zurich. Uh, across the street, we had a family uh, uh, who refused to have her children uh, play with those Jew boys across the street. Uh, and um, Mm. Uh, and it was it was their loss because they were also intellectually challenged. Uh, just as a, as to to add to that, um, and uh, it really upset my mother because uh, after all that had happened, that this would continue after after the war. Um, uh, her parents had died in uh, Treblinka. Uh, so and of course now I had regretted actually you know in later years. Uh, not asking questions about my family and the many relations who perished. My brother was probably quite affected by the event since he was five years older. And for him, the crossing into Switzerland uh, was a traumatic event that I'm not, that I'm sure left scars in later years. He was too young to really understand, but old enough to realize how serious uh, things were. So that's, that's my background. And, uh, Michelle, do you have children? No. Why? No, because I never got married. <laughs> M Michelle, you've talked about having a heightened sense, sensitivity towards anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. Is that also uh, like a consequence of your experience? Well, I think that, uh, yes, uh, quite definitely. Um, in terms of what people said, you know, when they ask you where you're from, why you, you were refugees in Switzerland, and uh, and and that kind of uh, thing, and uh, I'm very aware of uh, when people say uh, negative things about Jews, and uh, I'm sure everyone else has heard those um, uh, kinds of remarks as well. Rosalie, do you, no, I'm you thinking, have... you know. A, a 16 month old being left away from the mother, that's pretty tough. That's really hard. Uh, apparently, yes, yeah. Um, and uh, that was one reason that my mother was very anxious to uh, see us uh, get together again because uh, she was afraid uh, I was going to just forget. Uh, yeah. I was very, I mean, I was probably, from what I understand, I, I don't remember the uh, Salvation Army nursery. Uh, but um, I was probably a very happy child, but uh, apparently after one of those visits, uh, I just wanted to go back and play with the toys that were uh, back mm -hmm. at the nursery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who were the people that took care of you? Who were they? As I know you say salvation. Uh, oh, they, they were some, actually, from what I understand, I mean, like I say, I don't remember who they were, uh, but from what I understand, they were very... Um, uh, much uh, wanting to do a good job and taking care good. of the children that were under their care. That's so good. I, I, I think I was probably under very good care. That's great. Yeah. Rosalie, and, we're, we, we have to, um, we have to keep, me. yeah. I know. Um, so our, thank you, Michelle. And we, we need to, um, let's hear from Elliot, who's also the child of Holocaust survivors. Good afternoon. 
My name is Elliot Eisenberg, and I am a second generation Holocaust survivor. Thank you for attending today. My parents were Holocaust survivors. My mother, Luba, of blessed memory, was born in Poland in 1927. My mom was 12 years old when the Nazis invaded Poland. She survived internment in four concentration camps, Leipzig, Starziko, Buchenwald, and Buna. She lost her mother, father, four sisters, two brothers to the death camps. My father, Yechiel, of blessed memory, was born in 1922. My dad was 17 years old, when his world was destroyed by the invasion of Poland by the Nazis in 1939. My dad had his father, two sisters, and five brothers killed in the Shoah. They were murdered for one reason. They were Jews. My father of blessed memory survived three years in the slave camp, Skarkovich in Poland. He endured unspeakable horror until he and his brother Milech of blessed memory escaped by cutting through barbed wire and making their way into the forest. They made their way back to Avance, their hometown. At this time, Avance was relatively safe under the control of the Russians. My parents felt that their greatest accomplishment was to survive the Holocaust. They said that by surviving the Shoah, they proved that the Nazi evil did not win. They helped defeat the Nazi plan, the final solution. <laughs> my dad and my mother smuggled to Germany from Poland after the war. Poland was still a very dangerous place for Jews after the war. It was easier to emigrate to the United States from Germany than it was from Poland. My mom and dad were married in 1945 in Germany. They emigrated to the United States in 1949, lived in Brooklyn where my dad worked as a tailor. Later, my family moved to New Jersey. My dad and mom ran a chicken farm and later my dad finished his career as a school bus driver. They came to America and raised four sons that graduated college. Eventually they had four sons, seven grandchildren and seven great grandchildren. I've been asked what the effects were on me. And as many things in life, it's complicated. Some of my earliest memories were that of hearing my mother wake up screaming in nightmares. I felt unable to help her and I would be up with uh, you know, insomnia thinking about it. My mom, didn't speak as much about the Holocaust as uh, my dad did later in life. I think she passed away too young to be able to really deal with the trauma. And also, as I had said, she was just a, a little girl when the war broke out, 12 years old. I personally, growing up, felt like my family's culture was different from other people that uh, I had met in America especially when I was going to a public school, felt a little bit as, as like an outsider. We didn't speak English in my house the way, you know, other people spoke English. And, uh, and later on, as I said, it, it, you know, it, it's complicated. Later on in life, as I got a little bit older, I felt angry about the loss of my family. You know, I, I'd see other people who had aunts and uncles and cousins and, you know, Thankfully, we, we had one uncle uh, who did survive and I have four cousins, but uh, other than that, we, we, you know, we lost everybody. And later on, I, I think probably a question that uh, I asked would be, uh, well, what if, you know, what if the, 
Holocaust hadn't been what, you know, my life would be. My parents were very, very thankful, you know, to be here in America, but, you know, we, 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 we felt a, a great uh, loss by the loss of our, you know, our, our culture in, in Europe. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, thank you, Ellie. I know that was so difficult. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Rosalie. Okay. You you um you have also a very difficult story. Can you share a little bit about your life growing up? Oh, do you want to know anything about my parents? Yes. Just... Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, my mother came from a large Hasidic family, the Gera Hasidim in Lodz and Warsaw and other places in Poland. And she was a very happy child. She said it was wonderful. And until the Nazis invaded. And then there was a Lodz ghetto. And since she uh, knew how to sew, she got a job in the one of the factories the Germans took over. And But uh, there was starvation and beatings and uh, what happened she was 17 when this happened and her father died of star her father was a rabbi and he died of starvation and told her that she had to tell stories she had to live and tell the story which she did and one day she said there was an she was out with her sister looking for potato skins they were starving and there was a, what they called an aussedlung the ner the nazis came took these uh, people her whole family rest of her family and gassed them at Chelmno. she thought to escape she took her sister to a train the train she didn't realize went to Auschwitz. And there, she said, it was it was horrible, horrible. She was lucky to get out. They sent, a, it was like a Schindler person. She ended up in Czechoslovakia, found her sister later in Terezin. They went back to Poland and the Poles tried to kill them. So they left and they went to a DP camp. My father was in Vilna. He was working at YIVO, the, uh, the Yiddish Research Institute. He was also a musician. He played many instruments and translated songs from Russian into English, Yiddish, etc. His brother was a violinist in the symphony. And uh, he knew Chagall, he hung out with all the artsy creatures. <laughs> but, uh, and he joined the Socialist Workers Party so he could do something good in the world. And of course the Nazis came with Vilna turned into a ghetto. And he decided with some of the others that they were not gonna negotiate with the Nazis. They escaped and they joined the partisans. All I know is my father was shot, taken to Dachau. And their prisoners picked him to be the one that, that would uh, serve the food to them, the scarce food. And he tried to prevent people from getting overly uh, sadistically attacked by the Nazis. He lived and he was in the death march at the end of the war, weighing 75 pounds and ended up in a DP camp, Feldafing. My parents met there and were married. And mom, my mother said Hitler was their matchmaker. And they came to the USA. And as far as me, uh, my mother did tell the stories over and over to me, to anyone who would, and she would have very sad moments, angry moments. It was hard to predict what she'd be like. And my father was distant and he would scream at night. So I was in and out of hospitals. I couldn't breathe. So back and forth, back and forth. I didn't go to school much because I was sick and I didn't speak English and I didn't like the teachers. I didn't like the feeling of the place. They used to do exercises where we'd hide under desks because there might be an attack. You know, the, it was frightened. So I would pretend escape and pretend I was in the movies and I would sing and dance when I was by myself. And my, I nagged my father to buy me a guitar and he finally did. And I taught myself how to play and I, and that saved me. And depression followed me all through my life. And what helped me was the music. And I did it. I got into theater things and lots of wonderful experiences that way. Then there was the EMDR I learned about. That was the best therapy. And also my uh, I went mass I went for graduate education and fell in love with Dr. Victor Frankel's work. He said, if you you can make meaning out of your suffering, that will liberate you. And so uh, I also went to the USSR to help Refuseniks and human rights activists and later went on to uh, study Judaic, Judaic studies. And uh, I think the, what impacted me to help me was meeting other second generation folks in Boston. They found there was a group and we shared stories and we understood each other because it was hard. Like a, 
you were saying, Elliot, you know, we didn't have family, we didn't live like Americans, we were different, and finding others like ourselves was great. And then the, the last thing is the path of Chuva. In Chuva, the ones that have created the problem, the ones that have done the bad deeds, have to look at themselves, understand what they have done, feel remorse, and then go meet and, and apologize to these the ones they have hurt. So I joined a group where we were both as children of survivors, three generations, and on the Nazi side as well. And we helped each other. We we cried. We did many things. We, I, I have much to say about that, but our work affected and helped each other. And we've also helped people in the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Peru, Guatemala. And we've written a book about it because we feel it'll at least give hope to the world that we can do something, make meaning out of the suffering we endured and our parents endured. Thank you. Rosalie, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so we're going to go back around the group and each spend maybe uh, one or two minutes to talk about um, wh what would you like the public to take away from the fact that the, the Holocaust and other gener genocides affect not only the, the um, immediate victims and survivors, but future generations. Michelle, do you uh, want to go first? Sure. Uh, yeah. Am I? No. Okay. I'm not muted for a change. Uh, okay. So um, uh, uh, for myself, uh, in later years, I had a heightened awareness of anti-Semitism, as was mentioned. And uh, I believe the story of the Holocaust has to be told. I've been closely associated with the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum. I believe I've become more anchored in Judaism. I've joined the uh, BHC up here in uh, New Hampshire. And I was actually, to tell the truth, never a member of any temple prior to that. I believe that experience, education, and upbringing shape one's character, worldview, and moral responsibility. We must learn to counter the threat to democratic freedoms from racism and ethnic and other forms of discrimination. We must keep the memories of the Holocaust victims alive, educate the public, especially the young, about those events and shape their sense of moral and spiritual responsibility. Future generations have an obligation to teach about the Holocaust. We have made some progress toward this goal with several states now requiring Holocaust education as part of their curriculum. Um, and I think only early intervention can stop the growth of fascist and white supremacy movement. If I can quote from my father's book, um, anti-Semitism can be effectively combated and annihilated only when the notion of equality and equal rights becomes a fundamental principle of our society and where we make our goal the wholeness of humanity. In this, since our fight against anti-Semitism is a part, a fight for humankind in general. So that's where I want to uh, leave it. Thank you. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Uh, Elliot, what, what, what about you? What do you want people to know? Uh, well, I think, uh, well, what I would like people to know is that the Holocaust was a tremendous negative, but there are ways that uh, we can turn things uh, positive from what we learn from uh, from the the Holocaust. You know, my dad was often asked whether he believed in in God, and he would always say, even after everything that uh, that he had been through, that that you need to have faith and uh, and and believe in in something. And faith is not just faith in God, but faith in people that you. You don't look away when people are, you know, they need things. You 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 look evenly. He he would he would say that you, you never look down on anyone. You you look up to everybody, you know. And uh, the Holocaust didn't happen overnight. It was it was something that uh, you know took many years. So you know, don't look away when uh, when you see things. It, it it was caused in a lot of ways by you know people not being, in, you know, not looking. 
and it could happen again and history can and and does repeat itself so i guess my my main thing is uh through education we can you know learn lessons and and turn that uh, negative into a into a learning education experience a, a positive thank you thank Amen. you elliot um How about you do you, uh yeah Dino? um so I've been thinking a lot about inheritance. Um, we inherit all sorts of things from our parents, property being the least of it, I think. People inherit musical, talent, intelligence, strong bones, <laughs> good teeth, bad teeth, a genetic marker for disease, a positive outlook on life, or conversely, a genetic disposition toward chronic anxiety depression, and so forth. Given all that gets passed down, either genetically or through the home environment, it's inconceivable to me that there would not be repercussions for the descendants of genocide survivors. Not the same in each family like we're hearing today, and hopefully we'll hear from other people in a bit, but maybe some mystery that has to be figured out or issue wrestled with or compulsion to right or wrong or behave a certain way. I think it's important for people to understand that the profound devastation caused by genocide, the murder of family members being ostracized, expulsion from one's home and community and even country has a kind of butterfly or rippling effect on the life of the family from generation to generation. I would hope that that understanding would lead to an extra measure of kindness and caution in our dealings with people. You just never know someone's story, their personal story, and the story of their family. And one other thing I've learned from preparing for this program, um, particularly from talking with Rosalie and with my son this morning, and I maybe most people know this already, and I'm just horribly behind the eight ball, but sharing stories is a way of discovery, self-discovery, and learning about other people and yourself and healing. I'm so grateful for this community for helping me with that, and I hope people will participate during the community chat. Thank you. And Rosalie, your turn. I am so touched by all of you and what you had to say. you all absolutely right and beautiful. I what can I say? Um, I learned about fascism. My father, at, in, in DP camp, he, he set up these protests about the fallen. Have to, we have to be aware of fascism. We have to be aware of when, how this happens. And I met a neo-Nazi, a former neo-Nazi. And I also listened to a German man who said how this happened, how this, this developed. And I think, yes, education and awareness. The, the man who was, the German man said that there was a, a, you know how there's a Dr. Spock book for how parents should raise children. Well, in Germany, there was break the will of the child. And the parents were seeing the children as tyrants and they wouldn't listen to them cry. They would, and the children grew up with this, what they call a toxic shame. And they were, they were very vulnerable. They wanted to be told how wonderful they are. And when a person like Hitler said, you're great, you're wonderful, we've heard this before, they felt this is the parent they didn't have. This is who we're going to follow. They fall in love with it. And education, as you all said, you know, it's very important to be aware of that. And, and also, Israel means one who wrestles with oneself, with others, with God, with the whole. We are wrestling with this. And I, I hope, I, my work is with hope that we can wake up the world here and there as much as we can to what possibilities of destruction can come if we follow wrong leaders. The kids have to be taught. They have to be shown the right way to live. And, and we, morality, justice, and compassion, very important in the world to uplift us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, I can hardly believe we're on target because I know how difficult telling these stories are, but fortunately we are and we have time for our community chat. Kate, it's your turn. 
Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, first, let me just say a, a note of gratitude, I think, on behalf of everyone in the audience today to the four of you for sharing such personal but also important stories for us to be hearing today. So thank you for doing that and doing it in a way where we could really hear but also digest what you had to tell us. It's complicated stories and you presented them all very compellingly. Um, so we do want to transition now to the open conversation piece of tonight's event, which will be most of the rest of our time together. Um, one thing I just wanted to note as we kind of make this transition, I think it's really powerful, powerful for us to see that each family that we've heard about today has had its own dynamics, right? There isn't one trend or one way that the after effects of the Holocaust or the Shoah has played out across the board. So there's some real complexity that I think we can talk about. Um, and I'm sure others from the audience have their own insights they could weave in or questions as well. Um, so at this point, we're going to invite folks in our audience to share any experiences or any reflections that you might have yourselves about the effects on subsequent generations. And I think the easiest way to do this, because we have such great turnout at today's event, which is wonderful, <laughs> is we're going to invite you to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you know how to use that, um, you can put your hand up if there's something that you would like to share with the group. And we'll kind of keep an eye out and call on folks that way. Um, if that's less comfortable for you, then we can also go into the chat and you can put questions or comments there. There were a couple comments that people put in, so I'll try and share those with the group as well at some point in the conversation. Um, and if you do share a comment verbally, we just ask that you try and keep your reflection or your question or your comment to about two minutes. And that way we can make sure we get to acknowledge multiple people in the conversation today. Um, yeah, and as, as we start to kind of wrap up together tonight, um, you know, what I'm thinking about is just we've heard a lot of really difficult stories, but important stories today. And I would encourage you, you know, as you think about what you've heard tonight to take some time to really process this. <laughs> you know, it's it's hard sometimes when you click, you know, end for your Zoom call and then you go back to life or you go back to dinner or whatever you have next. But, <laughs> um, you know, share share these stories with other people. Take care of yourselves tonight. Take some time to think about what you've heard. Um, there are also probably other folks in the audience who have stories that they could have told but chose not to tonight. And if you're someone who wants to connect more with this committee, you know, reaching out to Dina or reaching out to others who are involved, um, there's always space for, you know, new members to kind of join and share their stories and their family's stories too. So know that the conversation doesn't just have to end with this event tonight. <laughs> so we would encourage you to really continue to reflect on the after effects of any type of mass atrocity and especially tonight, the Shoah or the Holocaust. Um, and I think what Dina said at the start, right, the fact that we have people all around us in our daily lives who are carrying these stories and experiences with them is such a helpful way of thinking about our world today, right? Um, so thank you all for being here with us. Thank you especially to those who are our featured um, presenters, but really to our audience members as well. And we're going to ask you just to stay tuned for one minute for a special treat. Um, we wanted to play for you a song that was written and performed by Rosalie, who is also also an accomplished musician, and we thought it would be a really beautiful way to kind of wrap up our program tonight. So we're going to play that for you now, and then we hope you'll all take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. We're here. Our seeds are planted in the land. We're here. Although they thought we'd die at their command We're here And no one ever will erase our stand We're here to love again, to live Begin again, to give We're here
Beautiful. Beautiful. And I don't know if Kate said that Rosalie not only wrote the song, but is singing it. It's beautiful. Thank you, everyone, for attending.